In so many ways, to be tested with power is so much more difficult than to be tested with persecution. Just like being tested with wealth is so much harder than being tested with poverty. Why? Because you have access. You have the ability to displease Allah, to take advantage of the one in front of you who seems to be weaker and in a position of powerlessness. When you look at the Prophet Wasallam, everything that he embodies of the perfection of character shines brightest on the day that he returned to Mecca. Because no person was hurt more than the Prophet Wasallam by the people of Mecca. The entire persecution and harassment and killing, all of it took place in targeting the Prophet Wasallam, and his family suffered. He suffered Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet when he comes back to Mecca, in Fatah Mecca, though no one would have blamed him had he taken revenge, he sought something so much greater than revenge. He sought the hearts and minds of those people that were in Mecca and everyone that would follow, that would read about the incident, Fatah Mecca. So we're past Hudaybiyah, the treaty has been made and the Prophet ﷺ has honored that treaty, the Muslims have honored that treaty and Islam has spread throughout the world because of the ability to do da'wah in a time of peace. Now Quraysh, they made the mistake of breaking the treaty of Hudaybiyah by facilitating an attack on Banu Khuza'ah, which was an ally tribe to the Muslims. And by doing so, they violated the treaty. Now. The Prophet Sallallahu clearly had received the news of this violation of the treaty before the people of Medina would find out. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that three days before the news even came back to us in al Medina that the people of Mecca had violated the treaty, the Prophet Sallallahu started to make these preparations for a large army that would march somewhere. And even Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he came to visit the Prophet sallam, he was confused by the Prophet sallam's preparations. Abu Sufyan was coming from Mecca as soon as he knew about the violation from his side. And he wanted to come to Medina knowing that this was a dumb move for the people of Mecca to try to salvage the treaty before it was too late because he knew that the Muslims had now grown to a place where the Meccans would not be able to withstand the force of the size of the army of the Prophet Sallallahu though the Prophet Sallallahu had been honoring that treaty all along. So Abu Sufyan, he gets to Medina to try to talk the Prophet Sallallahu into staying within the terms and the Prophet Sallallahu has already at that point begun to amass the army that will proceed towards Mecca. And he ignores Abu Sufyan and he makes his way to Mecca with 10,000 soldiers on the 10th day of Ramadan. So we are now in Ramadan and this is the eighth year and they are making their way towards Mecca under the Prophet Sallallahu in this massive show, right, of force that exists at this point. And Rasulullah Sallallahu is not going towards Mecca in Ihram, Rather, the Prophet Sallallahu at this point is assuming the full armor of battle and the Prophet Sallallahu has his sword, he has his bow and his arrow Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he has his shield and he embarks on this journey with his camel Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and the people following him towards Mecca as the treaty has now been violated from Mecca. Therefore, there is no reason for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi at this point to stay within this treaty. Now, Abu Sufyan, in justice would be the first person killed, right? For everything that he did against the Prophet Sallallahu all the times that he killed Muslims, all the times he organized against the Prophet Sallallahu But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not looking to make an example out of Abu Sufyan, rather the Prophet Sallallahu is looking to demonstrate the example of Islam. And so even as many of the companions are rightfully angered and they're looking forward to that moment where they can come back to Mecca and take revenge, the Prophet ﷺ constantly cools the temperature of his army and lets them know that this is going to be a day of rahmah. This is going to be a day of mercy, not a day of slaughter. That this is going to be a day of reconciliation, not revenge. We're going to demonstrate the high ideals of Islam. And just as we fought back in Badr for the sake of Allah, we will restrain ourselves on this day for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
So the Prophet ﷺ not only is not going to punish Abu Sufyan, but rather Al-Abbas says to the Prophet ﷺ, look, Abu Sufyan is a proud man. So as you come back into Mecca, if you could find a way to still give him some level of honor and respect, then do so because he's looking to win hearts Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, of course, to some of the Sahaba, the Bilaz of the world, the Ammars of the world, may Allah be pleased with them all, they just wanted to take them out. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is looking for a way to grow this community. So he announces Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he enters into Mecca, Man dakhla dara Abi Sufyan fa huwa amin. Whoever enters into the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. And he continues to march forward Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is the 17th day of Ramadan, which is by the way, the same day as Badr, and the Prophet Sallallahu is marching forth. And Abu Sufyan is standing next to Al-Abbas Sallallahu Ta'ala Anhu, and he's looking at this army. And Abu Sufyan is saying to Al-Abbas, your nephew has amassed mulkan azima. He's amassed an incredible army at this point. No one's going to be able to stand up against him at this point. I mean, this is an incredible army. And Al-Abbas says, Ya Abu Sufyan, inna han nubuwa. Oh, Abu Sufyan, it is prophethood. This is not a worldly demonstration. This is prophethood. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessing his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with what he promised him. Isn't it time that you recognize him as Rasulullah, that you recognize that he is indeed the messenger of Allah? Next, they pitched a tent for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the outskirts of Mecca. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed much and did much sajda out of shukur, out of prostration of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the moment that was ahead of him. And then the Prophet Sallallahu proceeds into Mecca and ahead of him is Abu Ubaidah al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu who is carrying the main flag. On one side you have Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, on another side you have Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and also commanding a portion of the Muslim army at this point is Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi enters into Mecca and the army descends upon Mecca from all directions. By all means, this is going to be payback and revenge, right? Remember how the Meccans acted in Uhud with the Muslims after Badr, even though they were the ones that drove them out? So by all means, it seems to be that way. But Rasulullah enters in that day and his nose was almost touching the back of his camel, meaning he entered in with humility, not riding proudly, but rather in humility to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And what was the Prophet saying the whole time? Was he chanting some slogans of ignorance? No. The Sahaba said Rasulullah was reading Surah Al Fatih. He was reading Quran the whole time. So he had his nose close to the camel's back and he was reading Surah Al Fatih, reading the Quran and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that moment. And Rasulullah proceeds straight to the Kaaba. And the people of Mecca now, I mean, they can't do anything, right? They have to watch this and they just have to wish for the best. So they're watching the Prophet Sallallahu do what he's going to do. And the Sahaba are not fully privy to what the Prophet Sallallahu is going to do. So Rasulullah Sallallahu goes straight to the Kaaba. That home that he wants was a part of rebuilding that was built by his father Ibrahim Alayhi Salam and Ismail Alayhi Salam. And where he once put the black stone to pull all of Mecca together. And the Prophet Sallallahu goes around the Kaaba. And with his bow, the Prophet ﷺ starts to pull down the idols that are erected around the Kaaba. Over 300 of them erected around the Kaaba. And the Prophet ﷺ recites, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say, the truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Verily, falsehood is bound to vanish. And he says that وسلم, as he's pulling down the idols. Then the Prophet ﷺ does tawaf around the Kaaba the way that he used to do. Then Rasulullah ﷺ goes to the door of the Kaaba and he calls Uthman ibn Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he takes the keys of the Kaaba. Uthman was a recent convert at this point. He takes the keys of the Kaaba from him. He opens the door of the Kaaba and then he hands it back to Uthman ibn Talha and he says, take it, O Bani Talha for you have the right to this until the day of judgment and these keys will not be taken from you except by a zalim, except by an unjust tyrant. So this was a sign that the Prophet ﷺ again is reconciling and he's acknowledging these places 
and he leaves the keys with this particular tribe, that until today, it is only from Banu Talha that the keys of the Kaaba can remain in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as it goes through Banu Shayba, which is the larger tribe, the keys go through there. He then proceeds into the Kaaba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And who enters the Kaaba with him? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, though he is reconciling hearts, he's not ditching his companions, those that struggled and strove. Who enters with him? Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the Prophet Sallallahu goes into the Kaaba and he starts to remove the idols and he looks and he sees the images of the prophets and the false gods that are on the walls of the Kaaba and the Prophet Sallallahu orders that they be wiped over. And then the Prophet Sallallahu continues to prostrate and pray out of thankfulness in the Kaaba, inside the Kaaba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The people of Mecca are completely silent watching the scene unfold. What's he gonna do next? He walks out Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the steps of the Kaaba and he looks out to the scene and he says, La ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la, sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al ahzaba wahda. There is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no God but Him. Sadaqa wa'da, he fulfilled his promise. Nasara abda, he aided his servant, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa hazam al ahzaba wahda. And he did away with the Confederates himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet is not acknowledging or not attributing the victory to himself, but rather he is attributing the victory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet calls out to Quraysh and he says, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, O people of Quraysh, verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abolished all of the pride and conceitedness that you used to take in Jahli and the days of ignorance in your tribes and in your ancestors. And all of the disputes between tribes, I am crushing them under my foot right now. SubhanAllah, remember when the Kaaba was constructed? The Prophet ﷺ brought the people together. Now he's doing the same thing. He says, all of the tribal warfare and all of this silliness, it's gone now. I'm putting it under my foot. And he said, SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, because all of you are from Adam and Adam is from Turab, Adam is from dirt. And then the Prophet ﷺ recited the verse, Ya Yuhan Nas, Inna Khalaqnakum Min Dhakarin Wa Untha. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ The verse in Surah Al-Hujurat, O mankind, verily we have created you from male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know one another. Verily the most honorable of you in the sight of Allah is the one who is most pious. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing, ever acquainted. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would then put Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to stand on the Kaaba to really solidify what he is saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to call the Adhan from the Kaaba. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and of course people objected, but it doesn't matter if some of them object. This is the new system, the new way that equality is granted and that the basis of superiority is piety in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and none deserved more to stand on the Kaaba and call Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar than Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was once under the feet of those pagans. So the Prophet Sallallahu establishes that for Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu and demonstrates what he is saying with this verse. Then the Prophet Sallallahu still on the steps of the Kaaba and Quraysh humbled, they can't do anything. The Prophet Sallallahu calls out to them and he says, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, O Quraysh, ma tarawna anni fa'ilun fikum. What do you think I'm going to do to you? What should I do with you? I mean, what would you do if you were in my situation? What should be done to you? And they said, Khaira, Akhun Karim, Wabnu Akhun Karim. They said, You will do good. You are a noble brother and the son of a noble brother. So they're hoping that the Prophet, you know, when he punishes them, when he punishes them, he will not punish them too severely. And you notice that the Prophet ﷺ always responds with Qur'an. He said, rather I will say to you what my brother Yusuf ﷺ said to his brothers. قَالَ لَا تَثْرِيبَ عَلَيْكُمْ الْيَوْمِ He's teaching them Qur'an subhanAllah in action with every incident that's taking place. There is no blame upon you today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you. وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And indeed, he is the most merciful of those who show mercy. اِذْهَبُوا فَأَنْتُمُ الطُلَقَى Go for you are free. SubhanAllah, no punishment on the people of Mecca. 
And you can imagine what this did to the hearts of the people of Mecca. How many people converted out of seeing the superior ethics of the Prophet Wasallam? If there was any doubt in their hearts that he was the Messenger of Allah, it was all solved in that moment of humility and mercy from him Wasallam. But then there's something else. Where is he gonna stay? What's gonna happen next? He's conquered Mecca. He has done away with the idol Wasallam. He told the people they can go free. The Prophet Wasallam would remain in Mecca for about 19 days. And at this point, his home has been conquered. The home that he used to stay with Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, it was taken when he was run out of Al Mecca. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he wants them to take the home that they grew up in, meaning Abu Talib's house. So he says to the Prophet Wasallam, aren't you going to go back to your own home, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet Wasallam said, did Aqil, your older brother, did he leave any inheritance for us? And Aqil had sold all of his property. So basically, the Prophet Wasallam's options are to stay somewhere else or to retake one of the homes that they were driven out of. And the Prophet Wasallam does not want to disrupt what he is establishing in the moment. So they said to the Prophet Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, Aina Tanzil, where are you going to stay? Where are you going to stay? He said, pitch me a tent in Hujun. And Hujun is significant for many reasons. One, it was where Quraysh initially signed the treaty to boycott Banu Hashim. And through that boycott came the deaths of Abu Talib and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Two, this is where Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha was buried. And so the Prophet Sallallahu wanted to be near the grave of Khadija radiallahu anha, who never got to witness the glory of Medina, nor the glory of the opening of Mecca. And three, and this is very important, it indicates that the Prophet Sallallahu is still a traveler. And so we don't know where he's going to stay at this point. In these days, as we exert ourselves with all sorts of good deeds that our Prophet Wasallam taught us, we invite you to spend in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so that we may all further ourselves along this journey and draw closer to Him.